Good morning. Hello, welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. This is episode number 181, which is just astonishing. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn. I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service, which has four archive centres across the Highlands of Scotland in Inverness, Wick, Fort William, and Portree, where we look after historic records relating to the Highlands of Scotland. If you're um, looking at our Facebook pages at all, you'll be seeing a lot of content going out this month for uh, the Archive and Record Association Scotland's um, Archive 30. So you'll be seeing huge amounts of our collections and what we do and who we all are. So please do have a look at our pages for that this month. This series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. If you're able to donate towards our work, and as I always say, I know many of you already have, and we are so grateful for that. So thank you very, very much. If you're able to be able to donate to, to our work, it is truly appreciated. It helps us to continue to do all the various things that we do. So welcome to this week's episode, as I say, episode number 181, and the one which starts the fifth year of Learn with Lorna, which is completely extraordinary. It's hard to believe that I've been doing Learn with Lorna for nearly half the time that I've been with the Archive Service now. Something that started as a, um, a couple of episodes to do during lockdown has just uh, blossomed into something huge and uh, wonderful for me and uh, um, thank you for joining me for it. So we're returning this week to one of my favourite subjects, Stories from Inverness Borough, which I first looked at back in the summer of 2020. So it's about time that I came back to some more stories from Inverness. And I'm going to be using obviously the Inverness Borough records, but also another of my very much loved collections, D390, The Papers of Margaret MacDougall, which I've done a Learn with Lorna episode on a long time ago, back episode number 41. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that already, please do go and have a look. It is the most fantastic collection from our point of view of being able to do research. We hold an extensive collection of records for Inverness Borough, including Town Council minutes from the 1550s onwards, legal papers, property records, uh, court papers, valuation rolls, say scenes, and a whole swathe of other material utterly fascinating set of records and <clears throat> excuse me the wonderful Margaret McDougall who was borough and county librarian and Inverness curator museum curator prior to her death in 1960 she worked intimately and constantly with these archives which would have been in her care so she spent a lot of time working with them researching transcribing studying these records I don't know if any one person has been more closely associated with the Inverness Borough records than the people who wrote them, really. Um, Margaret McDougall and the people who wrote them originally have spent so much time immersed in them. And as I've said previously, we hold, uh, I'm going to call her Meg, we always call her Meg, so I, I can't get out of that habit. So we hold all of Meg's notes, her lecture notes, her research notes, her publications, correspondence, so I'll be drawing on that collection today as well, the collection that she produced using those other records that we also hold. So I'll be using the records of Inverness Borough and the papers of Margaret MacDougall, in which, as I say, she uses those collections anyway to tell stories of Inverness's people, places, events, traditions and all sorts of things. So let's get started with an overview um, an extract from Margaret MacDougall's overview of Inverness. It is pages and pages long and I could have shared all of it, but I'm just going to share this extract to start with. The age of a town is of less importance than its history, but if age and history go together, Inverness can claim to be one of the oldest boroughs in all Scotland. Early writers claim Inverness was founded before the dawn of the Christian era and archaeological discoveries in the Valley of the Ness support the belief that a small community dwelt there in the days of prehistory. It was to Inverness that St Columba came in AD 565 to visit the Pictish King Brood. Where the King's Castle was situated is now a matter of conjecture, but Craig Fadrick 
surrounded, surmounted by the remains of a vitrified fort, is accepted as the most probable site. King Brood at this time ruled his Pictish kingdom from Inverness, and from its position as capital of Brood's Pictish kingdom, Inverness derives its proud title, the capital of the Highlands. Few written records remain of those early centuries, and it's not until the 11th century that we find documentary proof of the early importance of Inverness as the chief town of the Highlands and as the capital of the ancient province of Murray. King David I, 1124 to 53, constituted Inverness a royal borough, one of the earliest royal boroughs in Scotland. This king made Inverness the seat of justice for the whole of the Northern Highlands, a position she still holds. At this time, Inverness was described as Capitali per totum regnum, one of the capitals or chief places of the kingdom. The military and strategic importance of Inverness in those early days prompted King William the Lion to fortify it in 1180. The fortifications consisted of a deep, deep ditch or fosse which encircled the whole town. In 1689, parts of this were still standing and were strengthened against MacDonald of Kepoch, who besieged the town at that time. The first stone castle on the present Castle Hill was built by King David about 1141, and beneath it, as beneath the castles that followed it, lies the town of Inverness. I, I love Meg. I love the way she writes things. I love the fact she has a lot of the same interests as me. And also the fact that she's using records that I can then go and look at the original to see where she's drawn that information from. She goes on a little bit further to say, in 1233, King Alexander II endowed and founded a Dominican priory at Inverness. This priory was the centre of culture and education, the children of the Burgesses receiving their education at the priory school. After the Reformation, the priory school was merged into the grammar school, which in due course became Inverness Royal Academy. During the Scottish Wars of Independence, it was from Inverness that the Highland contribution to this struggle was organised. Alexander Pilch, a Burgess of Inverness, was the Lieutenant of Andrew de Murray, leader of the Highlanders, who fought under Sir William Wallace and was present at the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297. Still later, Alexander Pilch joined King Robert the Bruce when the King made his first bid to overthrow the English. Pilcher was helped to capture the castle of Inverness for the Scots and was knighted in 1307 when King Robert came to Inverness. The early kings of Scotland were frequent visitors, sometimes as warriors to battle with rebelling Highland chiefs, sometimes as dispensers of justice and sometimes on peaceful missions. She goes on to describe what happened in Inverness in the 1400s, the raids by the Lords of the Isles and others. As we come further a little bit forward, and you can see already how different this is from uh, the story of Fort William Borough that we looked at recently, uh, just totally really interesting how the different Borough stories evolve and develop. We come into the 1500s and the visit of Mary, Queen of Scots, to Inverness in 1562, when she was refused entry to Inverness Castle, a decision that I'm fairly for sure that the governor of the castle came to regret when he was executed for treason for not letting her in. We come in, on from the 1500s into the 1600s, we come into the Covenanting Wars and Cromwell's Fort, built in Inverness at a time when Cromwell's soldiers occupied Inverness following the execution of Charles I. And this is how Meg describes the fort, which cost £8,000 to build. Situated at the end of Shore Street, from the exchange, proceed along Church Street and Chapel Street, turning right where Chapel Street is joined by Shore Street. So anyone who's watching locally will be per perhaps aware of where I'm talking about. The building of the Citadel, or the Sconce, as it was called locally, began in 1652 and took five years to complete. The Citadel was a five cor was five cornered with bastions with a great with a wide grass or bench that in an ordinary bark might sail in at, at a full tide. So it's been built on the shore so that uh, ships can come up to it. She goes on to describe the structure of it, how it was built, how it was, uh, the kind of architectural features of it. In the centre of the citadel, there was a great four square building of hewn stone 
called the magazine or the granary. In the third story was the church, well furnished with a stately pulpit and seats. There was a wide bartizan on top and a brave great clock with four li large dials and a bell. The garrison in this fort consisted of some 1,500 men who were stationed in the citadel or in the neighbourhood of Inverness. The citadel did not stand long, for in 1662, five years after it was completed, it was demolished when the garrison was removed from the town. The townspeople went in a body to the citadel and raised it to the ground. All that now remains is the clock tower and the, and the clock and parts of the ramparts. The stones that were built for building the fort were taken from the neighbouring abbeys and monasteries, notably from Black, Blackfriars Priory in Inverness, the Abbey of Bewley in Kinloss, and the Episcopal buildings at Shannonry. She goes on to note how, um, despite the fact that they resented the soldiers, and actually there is a similarity there with when I was speaking about Fort William with that, that garrisoning by Cromwell's soldiers. Really interesting to think that they had a foothold here. Um, but how they were resentful of them when they arrived and how they didn't want Cromwell's soldiers to be taking up this space in the town. There were gradually, as there often are in times of conflict, numerous marriages and um, close associations between those incoming soldiers and the locals. And then that when the garrison departed in 1662 on the restoration of Charles II to the throne, um, an eyewitness said this, Never people left a place with such reluctancy. It was sad to see and hear their sighs and tears, pale faces and embraces at their parting farewell to that town. So interesting that although they were very much resented when they arrived, it looks like <clears throat> they had some fond feelings of Inverness. Interesting that there's an eyewitness account. So I'm going to pause there for a second from Margaret MacDougall's notes to go back and look at some of the entries in the borough records from those early days. There are some fantastic entries in the borough minutes from the 1680s and 1690s, which illustrate just how Inverness, how central Inverness continued to be, how involved in politics and in questions of rightful monarchy and governance. So we've already touched there on the wars of independence. We've touched on Cromwell, uh, the, the interregnum, the restoration of the monarchy and Inverness is central to all of these conversations and then when we come into the 1680s and 90s and it's something I have talked about a lot with the Jacobite Risings again how involved Inverness continues to be so listen to this extract this is Inverness preparing for a possible invasion of Jacobites in 1689 and they wrote on the 4th of April so 335 years ago today that the town is in great fear through the Highlanders who are threatening to fall on the lowlands. So they say that and then it's followed by these entries. 9th of April 1689. Uh, Thomas Hossack to go to, so the borough uh, magistrates are discussing what they should do to take precautions and they are advised to go to their neighbouring merchants to provide and buy from them the number of 100 weight of powder and 200 weight dead for the use of the town. The treasurer is to pay for this out of the common good. So they've been sent to get uh, gunpowder and, and lead. Sorry, I've just realised there's a spelling mistake there. I thought it made no sense when I said it. Uh, powder and lead. So they've been sent out to go and to purchase that for the good of the town's protection. And the fact that it's for the town's protection means it's being funded out of the common good. The whole inhabitants of the borough and liberties without exception between 60 and 16, between this and Friday next, are ordered to come by one o'clock and muster and be sufficiently furnished with arms. So they're so worried about the Jacobites invading Inverness that they're buying weapons for the town out the common good. They are giving them to all the inhabitants of the borough. Interesting, it doesn't just specify men there as well. The whole inhabitants of the borough between the ages of 16 and 60 to come into the town, get their weapons and be ready. The provost and the late magistrates having been accepted, they send their servants instead. Some things don't change. To meet uh, at the butts next to the chapel yard under the pain of £20 Scots to each person not sufficiently armed. So if they don't come, they don't get their weapons, there will be a fine for them. 
this act of council to be published at the market cross by tuck of drum. So this will be announced by an equivalent of the town crier with a drum announcing it of what's to happen. Going forward into June 1689, the council consider the great fear and danger that this town is exposed to by the furious threatenings of the Highlanders, insurre Highlanders insurrectionists, all inhabitants to go to the, to the butts again the next day under the pain of loss of freedom and other punishments. So also an interesting little reference there, it said that intimation will be made at the Market Cross, so that standard and the town sort of centre, but also in the four streets of the town. And it's those little passing references that give you uh, understanding of what the town was like at the time. So Inverness for centuries was just the four streets. It goes on to refer to the, during that 1689, 88, 89, 90 kind of Jacobite rising, references to payments by inhabitants for the fortification of the town, to get trenches dug in the town. And no worry, no wonder that they were worried because Col MacDonald of Kepoch, who had previously been imprisoned but in Inverness jail following a dispute with the Macintoshes, which had escalated into a full clan battle, MacDonald of Kepoch was back and he was now campaigning for the Jacobites and he threatened to burn Inverness to the ground if he wasn't given 4,000 Scots marks and a scarlet laced coat. It's really interesting, everywhere I've found reference to it, they say 4,000 marks we can understand, but why is he after a scarlet laced coat? There you go. And Bonnie Dundee, who was the Jacobite military leader, had come to Inverness himself to calm the situation before Macdonald and uh, Dundee went off to fight in the Battle of Killycranky, where Bonnie Dundee would be killed. And there are references in the minutes to the town inhabitants trying to find this 4,000 marks to get rid of Col MacDonald and get him to leave. So it's just really interesting, as I've said so many times, that there's these huge events going on right across the country, and Inverness is absolutely involved in them, although people might think that our towns and our boroughs and our communities in the Highlands are kind of on the periphery. We've seen before how Dornoch is central, how Tain is central to what's happening. Fort William is Inverness is involved in all of these discussions, whether that's the wars of independence, through the restoration, through the Jacobite risings, and then of course into later conflicts as well. Really interesting. But in the 1600s, so they've got Col MacDonald surrounding the town with the MacDonalds of Kepoch surrounding the town, demanding this money and his scarlet coat. But it wasn't just the Jacobites that were worrying Inverness in the 1600s. This is an entry appearing in the midst of all of those. So still uh, 18, 1680s, 1690s, right in the middle of all of that furore of the Jacobite rising, this entry appears. That day, the council taking to their serious consideration the bad fame and information given them about uh, Isabel McConaughey, alias MacAndrew, spouse to Donald McRory at the Millburn. So, uh, in interesting, the place names don't don't change. Um, but also, so this one lady, but also Janet McConaughey, MacAndrew, her sister, spouse to Finlay McGeeve, I think it's McGreven, which it's an unusual name, maybe I've made that wrong. I'm looking at the original writing, so forgive me. Um, Wheelmaker in the barony of Castle Hill for witchcraft committed by them upon several persons within the said borough. So they are not only dealing with the Jacobites surrounding the town demanding money and scarlet coats, but they've also investigating witchcraft within their boundaries as well. And they don't know what to do. And so they write in the borough minutes that they are going to try and gather evidence about these um, about these women, see if we can find what they're doing. I didn't see another reference to it over the next few pages, so I went on to check the website Survey of Scottish Witchcraft and didn't see their names there either, suggesting that there was no trial, there was no follow-up. But it's really interesting just to see, and I know I say that every week, it's really interesting, but there's just so many things here that make me go away and ponder and think further about things. Um, just to see that all the things that the town is dealing with at that point, and we're in, what's that, late, late 1600s, 
we're coming to the end of the witchcraft sort of starts to the laws are passed in the 1700s to to stop it um being such a concern but all of these things are are being dealt with at the same time in amongst those entries about the mcdonald's of keppock surrounding the town in amongst entries about general borough finances and things now margaret mcdougall who would 100 percent be one of my dinner party guests if we were playing that game where you get to invite any people dead or alive to a dinner party she shares with me a love of the Inverness Borough Treasurer's accounts and all the stories that the Treasurer's accounts contain. So I've spoken so far about minutes and the sort of stories that are recorded in there. But actually, in the Treasurer's accounts, you might get one line that gives you a payment for something, but that takes you away on a whole story and a whole area of research. And I've spoken before about the impact of the 1715 and 1745 risings on Inverness that can be seen through the treasurer's accounts as well as through the minutes and other documents. So I won't um, go into that, into the 45, but <clears throat> if we have a look at what else the treasurer's accounts can tell us about Inverness in the 18th century. Now I could spend happily hours and hours, and anyone who's been on a tour with me will know because I usually bring this volume out for people to look at and then wax lyrical about why I love it but but I was so just excited to see that Mar Margaret McDougall felt exactly the same way about it that I do this is a talk that she gave she died in 1960 so she must have given this talk I don't know 70 or 80 years ago but she's picking out many of the same things that I would pick out and so I'm going to read to you an extract from the talk that she gave for my talk tonight, I intend to take you back to the 18th century and tell you some of the sidelights which can be culled from an examination of the town's letter books and accounts. The town's accounts reveal some, to me at least, interesting details of municipal expenditure. Taxpayers today protest against rising rates and de demand economies. In this, they do exactly what the 18th century ratepayers did and have exactly the same results. 200 years ago, the town's employees were well paid and were the envy of the townspeople. Just like many in the modern town council, employees had jobs for life, or at least during the council's pleasure. They shared in common the rate players' criticism of having well paid, cushy jobs in which they seldom seemed to work for the salaries they were given. The best paid official, and in many ways the most necessary town official, was the executioner, who got the princely sum of five pounds per year. For each execution, he got one pound. For other services such as floggings, ducking women in the river, putting them in the pillory, jugs, stocks, etc., he got six and eight. He also got other extras such as money for ropes for binding the criminal, oil for the gallows, the hangman's noose, and so on. He got a free house situated in the chapel yard, free fire and light, free boots and clothing, and free fish from the fish market. The last executioner was paid a greater yearly sum than the town clerk, and when he retired in 1834, he had saved a thousand pounds sterling. She goes on to detail the borough's payments to visiting notable people, saying that in some years, paying for visits um, for entertaining people made up nearly 50% of the town's revenue. Before going on to record the payments made to other borough officials, so I've mentioned there the, um, the executioner, but she goes on to talk about the payments made to the knock keeper, to the drummer, and the teachers of the grammar school, the music school, the dancing school, all of which wonderful Meg has written histories of, researches of each of those institutions and each of those roles. If we come forward into the 1800s. Now, I've mentioned before that the... 1800s are the absolute heyday, the pinnacle really for record keeping and there are a huge number of documents that I could call on to tell the story of the changes that this that this century saw. If you think about just previous Lermavarna episodes, the fact that education has changed entirely in this century, in the 1800s. Trains come in, poor relief legislation comes in, mental health legislation comes in, the changes in science and medication, in religion with the disruption. It is such a transformative century. 
And Inverness had, of course, for centuries had schools, had institutions, but suddenly it had all this new infrastructure coming in, new buildings, new legislation, new legislation to contend with. So those schools that I spoke about from the 11, 1200s, suddenly all those educational things which have long roots are transforming in the 1800s. And then from a, from a building's point of view, in Inverness specifically, we see the new schools, the new churches that were built as a result of the disruption, new schools because of the Education Act. The cathedral was built in the 1800s, the townhouse, the current townhouse was built in the 1800s, the current castle was built in the 1800s. So Inverness is completely and utterly changing at this point. And of course, the prolific work of Alexander Ross, the architect, is everywhere at this point being in the right place at the right time. He was quite the man for that. But it wasn't all construction and change in the 1800s. Inverness saw disruption and destruction as well. So this is the story of the town steeple, which had been in evidence since at least 1509, but had been rebuilt in the 1780s. And this is the story of what happened. On the 22nd of August, 1789, the foundation stone of the jail and steeple was laid, a large gathering of notabilities and townspeople being present at the ceremony. The local Masonic lodges, St John's, Kilwinning and St Andrews, attended in full regalia, wearing black coats, vests and breeches with white gloves and stockings. Two local stonemasons, Charles and James Smith, were employed to build the steeple up to a certain height. Unfortunately, the record only says a certain height doesn't tell us what the certain height was. So this is in the late 1700s, 1800s. You're wondering why I'm talking about the 1800s then going back to the 1780s. We will see. The designer of the steeple, Mr Alexander Lang of Edinburgh, took an active interest in the pro progress of the building and Bailey Ingalls was a daily visitor to see that everything went smoothly. Part of the Bailey's duties uh, involved selling of materials from the old spire and the purchasing of iron, stone and wood for the new steeple. On its completion in 1792, its graceful lines and well-proportioned design was much admired and the townspeople were justly proud of it. The town bells had been rehung, and the new clock gave it an air of added distinction. The newness had hardly worn off when tragedy struck. At 10.40pm on Tuesday the 13th of August, 1816, when most of the people were in bed, a violent earthquake shook the town. Slate rattled from the rooftops, chimney pots and chimney stacks crashed to the ground. Buildings trembled and terror-stricken townspeople were tossed out of bed and fled screaming into the streets. When morning came and the overnight panic had subsided, it was found that the steeple had not escaped unscathed. Some inches from the top had been rent and twisted round from east to northwest giving the spire a curious and unusual appearance. As might be expected, the townspeople were terrified that it would fall, but as time passed and nothing happened, its curious appearance began to attract visitors who were fascinated by it. Little, little realising the value of this twisted spire as a tourist attraction, the magistrates, some 12 years after the earthquake, had the steeple repaired and straightened. Thus, they thus brought down upon themselves the wrath of those who had believed the steeple to be perfectly sound, not in need of repair, and good for attracting the tourists. Hugh Miller, a noted geologist and one of the critics, was outspoken in his opinions. He considered the repair of the steeple unnecessary and said that as it had been, when it had been twisted, it had been one of the greatest curiosities in the kingdom, which, if left unrepaired, would, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, have lasted for many years. So there you go, uh, the twisted twisted spire that could have been the tourist attraction for, for longer than it was. So as I mentioned in Vanessa in the 1800s is seeing all this transformation, change in legislation, in um, technology, design, buildings, infrastructure, huge change. We then have in amongst that natural disasters. So if we have that earthquake, but it was followed by a waves of cholera in the uh, 1830s and 1840s, and also by horrendous catastrophic floods, which swept the stone bridge in the town away and caused 
complete devastation. And I've just found that really striking as I was kind of pulling all that together and going in the middle of the disruption, in that break away from the established church, the creation of the free church, the people must have wondered what on earth was happening to their world, that they were being inundated with natural disaster, illness, plague, problem, and that dis literal that disruption to their way of life and their religion and their beliefs. But as we come to the end of the 1800s, things begin to look a little brighter, quite literally begin to look a little brighter because we hold a document from November 1898 in which the Edinburgh Gazette published a notice by the Provost, Magistrates and Town Council of the Royal Borough of Inverness announcing their intention to apply to the Board of Trade for authorisation to produce, store, sell, supply and distribute electricity within the borough. I think we forget, and I know I've said this before in previous episodes, I think we forget that so much of our past happened in darkness or by candlelight. Edinburgh had trialled electric street lighting in 1881 and Inverness was obviously keen to keep up in the 1890s by establishing, producing, selling, supplying electricity. And I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to come into the 20th century. Um, I've spoken many times before about the impact of the First and Second World Wars. And I think I'm going to leave Inverness there in the turn into the 20th century, delighted that they're getting their electric lighting and blissfully unaware of the challenges that the 20th century was about to throw at them. That's a whole other episode of Inverness in the 20th century. But the real joy for me in doing these sort of stories from Inverness or Tales from Tain or those sorts of ones is that there's always more stories. There's always more I can come back to. I could do another 20 episodes on stories from Inverness. But I wanted to leave you with a final quote from Meg from a talk that she gave in the mid 20th century. Because as I said, she's very much a kindred spirit of mine and she finished her talk with these words. When I speak of old Inverness, I forget time and I forget how quickly it passes and I often forget that other people might not be quite as interested in my subjects as I am. If tonight I have told you something that you did not know before, then I'm glad I've done so. And if on the other hand, some of you have heard these stories before, I hope that you found that a twice told tale is sometimes as interesting as when heard the first time. Thank you very, very much for joining me for the past four years of Learn with Lorna. Thank you for coming with me into the fifth year. I know some of you have watched every single episode and I could not be more grateful for the support that you have given me and that you've given the service and your enjoyment in the stories that we care for. So thank you so much for joining me. Next week, we'll be looking at records to do with Caithness Poor Relief. So I hope you can join me then. But a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we really are grateful for that. And thank you again for all your support and kindness over the last few years. I can't tell you how much it's appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>